from the Midtown Detroit studios of WDET. This is Detroit Today. This is a nation of immigrants, as we often say, and many who come to our shores find economic success in ways that stretch beyond those who are born here. Why is that? Leah Bustan, a professor of economics at Princeton University, looks deeply into that question in a new book titled Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. She joins today to discuss what she found. It's next on Detroit Today, but first the news from NPR. Welcome to Detroit Today on 1019 WDET. I'm Stephen Henderson, and as always, thanks for joining us. Walk around your neighborhood and tell me what foods you smell cooking in a nearby kitchen. What about the decorations that adorn the homes in your neighborhood? And what kinds of restaurants and shops do you pass on your way to work? Most likely, the cultural signifiers around you are not from one single place or origin. Southeast Michigan is home to people from all over the world. It is one of our greatest strengths as a community. Asians, Arabs, Europeans, Latinos all come from a spectrum of countries to call this place home. According to one perspective, of course, that's not odd. It's central to the American experiment. As we say all the time, this is a country of immigrants. But we all know that all Americans don't always have a favorable opinion of immigration or immigrants themselves. Those hailing from non-European countries specifically have been banned from entering the United States at various times. And in the last 10 years, a lot of people have expressed particular hatred for those who want nothing better than a better life in America. A new book called Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success, lays out why immigration is both good for immigrants and good for us who are born here in America. The book, co-authored by Leah Bustan, explains why children of immigrants from around the world consistently succeed in climbing the economic ladder. It also explains why immigration expands our economic pie. We want to interrogate today how immigration has an impact on us in our communities and how the American public has been responding to the ways that immigration has changed over the past hundred years. Here to talk about this is Leah Bustan. She is a professor of economics at Princeton University and the co-author of Streets of Gold. Professor Bustan, welcome to Detroit Today. Great to be here. So you start writing about immigration stories as myths. What are those myths? What are we getting wrong about immigration here in our country? Well, I think The first myth is very simple. It's the idea that we're in some kind of unprecedented flood of immigration or immigration crisis, as if we've never had more immigrants in the country than we have right now. And that's actually just flat out wrong. Um, Right now, one in every seven residents in America is foreign born. And if you go back 100 years to the Ellis Island generation, that was also true. And it was true for 50 years in a row. So we've only just gotten there now um, as of 2020. So, you know, check back with me in 50 years if we still have (laughs) so much immigration. And, you know, you could say, all right, we're really in an era of mass migration. Um, But I think we hear these headlines all the time that we are, you know, there's a caravan coming or we're in a, a, a crisis. And that part is just, you know, really um, uh, incorrect. 
Uh, but then I think we also have some nostalgic views about immigration 100 years ago um, and, and a lot of myths that we've built up about the immigrants that came from Europe um, during this Ellis Island period. Um, it's this idea of rags to riches, maybe, or people who arrived with just a dollar in their pocket, you know, landed in New York um, and made their way on their own um, and moved up quickly. Um, and that somehow the immigrants today are not as successful in doing so. So we, we really wanted to compare immigrants today to immigrants 100 years ago. We have this very, you know, hazy and optimistic view about immigrants then. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to compare immigrants now. Yeah. And so tell us what you found in that in that comparison. I mean, obviously, there are pretty significant cultural differences between the majority of immigrants who were coming to this country a hundred years ago and today, what other kinds of comparisons did you, did you find? Well, it's exactly right. Like you said, a hundred years ago, immigrants uh, from many non-European uh, parts of the world were banned from the U S. So uh, immigrants a hundred years ago were almost entirely from Europe, whereas Im immigrants today come from around the world. Um, so there's no reason to believe uh, at the outset, that immigrants now and then would necessarily uh, perform similarly in the economy. So we wanted to turn to the data to see what was really going on. And in order to do that, um, we wanted to move beyond the anecdotes, you know, or the stories that make it to the newspaper, which could be very positive. It could be, you know, a CEO, an immigrant um, born abroad who makes it to the C-suite, or it could be something very negative, like a criminal. So we wanted to really turn to the broad data, and we put together records for millions of immigrant families today and millions of immigrant families in the past. And what we found really surprised us is really just how similar the immigrant story has been um, over those two time periods. Um, when you look at the immigrants themselves, if immigrants are coming from poor countries and start out not earning very much, they do move up the ladder, but that progress is pretty slow. Hmm. So the idea of this rags to riches 100 years ago, 100 years ago that's really uh, you know, a myth that we might hear from our families or we might hear in a high school history class. That's not the way it was. It took time even then. Um, but where there's a lot of immigrant success is in the second generation, the children of immigrants. You know, these are kids who primarily were born here or if they did come with their parents, they came young. And so they go to U.S. public schools, English is their first language, and they, even if they're um, being raised in poor households, they really move up the ladder quickly in both time periods. Mm -hmm. and, and why is that true? What is it about uh, immigrants today who are able to move up so much faster than people 100 years ago? Um, well, um, first of all, it's important to, uh, to, to notice in the data that this is a pattern that's happening for many different sending countries. Um, I think, you know, when you first think of, well, children of immigrants doing really well, you might have in your mind an image of, you know, kids whose parents are from Asia you know, Korean or Chinese or Indian say, well, of course, you know, um, we know that there's groups that are doing well, but what about uh, the rest of the countries? And actually what we're finding is that the children of immigrants from around the world are doing quite well today, um, whether their parents might be from Mexico, from Central America, Nicaragua, El Salvador. And so the story has to be um, bigger than just one particular immigrant community. Um, and I think that when we talked to friends, they said, well, it's immigrant work ethic. It's immigrant parents care more about education. So that was the, um, the I guess, the hypothesis that a lot of people have in mind. And what we found was a little bit different. Um, what we find is that um, immigrants move to dynamic cities. And those cities set themselves up for finding work and also set their kids up. Uh, for having a successful life in the next generation. 
you know, either having a good set of educational institutions or a good set of jobs for the kids to move into. And this is really true now, and it was especially true 100 years ago. Um, at 100 years ago, the U.S. had a lot of farms, had a lot of agricultural areas, um, and particularly in the South, um, there was a lot of cotton growing, um, big plantation type agriculture, and it was not a place where there was a lot of upward mobility for anyone, and immigrants avoided moving to the South. They also avoided moving to other types of rural areas, and they really beelined for, um, for cities, and that set their kids up for success. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when there's something special about immigrants, it's not necessarily that they work harder, but they've already showed us that they're willing to move, and they're willing to move to places with opportunities. And, and that strikes a contrast, I think, with those of us who are born here in, in many ways, right? Um, I, I think about the city of Detroit in particular when, when, I'm, when I'm saying that, the, the not just emotional pull of home, but the emotional obligation, I think, that so many of us who were born, for instance, in Detroit feel to be here and to be part of this community and trying to make it better uh, prevents a lot of us from from going off to to other places. I mean, there is a kind of a built-in expectation in many communities that if you're born there, you you should stay there or close by. Um, and that's kind of the opposite of the dynamic you're describing uh, with immigrant families. That's exactly right. Um, What we see in the data is that U.S.-born families that move from their state of birth actually look very similar to immigrant families. Their kids are doing uh, very well. And so it's not that there's something special about moving across borders. Anyone who's taking a big move um, and is seeking out economic opportunity can also participate in the kind of upward mobility that we're talking about But there are many people born in the U.S. who, as you're describing, they're born into a a set of family connections, their friend network, people they went to high school with, a a community that they care about and they want to give back to. And so what we're able to measure in the data is just about how much you're earning. It's not about whether you're having a good life, which can mean so much more than just what you're taking home in your paycheck. Um, So we can't compare whether immigrant families are happier Mm. um, or they're more fulfilled. Um, So we do, it's a really important caveat that you're bringing up here. Um, We don't know whether U.S. born families that stay close to home are doing that because they're not seeking opportunity or actually because they're very closely connected and that's where they want to stay. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're talking about immigration. We're talking about immigrants and what they find when they come to our country. Our guest is Leah Bustan. She's a professor of economics at Princeton University and co-director of the development of the American Economy Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Her latest book is Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of immigrant success. Uh, We want to hear from you, of course, during this conversation. What's your understanding of American immigration? Do you think immigration offers uh, a particular pathway to success for people? Of course, we want to hear from you if you are an immigrant to America and especially to Southeast Michigan, uh, this place we call home that is so culturally rich because of the number of immigrants who come here and because of the number of countries from which people uh, decide to come to America, to our little part of uh, of the world. Uh, the, it's hard to imagine Southeast Michigan without the influence of so many different uh, immigrant communities. Uh, tell us what that experience has been like to be an immigrant here. Uh, are you maybe the child of immigrants? And tell us how you found yourself becoming part of the American experiment and how your family has been able to find success, uh, economic success here. Uh, Also, give us a call and let us know if you feel like being an immigrant is sometimes a barrier to opportunity or success. Are there things in the way 
that may not be evident to those of us who aren't immigrants. Uh, as always, the number here on the phones is 313-577-1019. That's 313-577-1019. You can also go to the WDET Facebook page or to Twitter and put comments there, and uh, we'll work you into the conversation uh, that way. Uh, Leah, this book is really data-driven. Um, talk about the ways in which uh, you can understand a really broad story about immigrants through data over over this last century. What what kind of data are you using and, and what is it telling you? Well, you can really think about us like curious grandchildren who are going to investigate their own family tree um, with all of the uh, historical records that are out there. So maybe some of your listeners have um, purchased a subscription to Ancestry.com, um, which is a website that allows you to type in names of people in your family and see if you can find old records. And that's basically what we did in this book, but we did it millions of times over. Um, And in fact, uh, we started by going to the website and just typing in some names. And then we said, well, this is a bit slow. Let's see if we can automate this procedure and start to pull data on thousands of people. And eventually the ancestry lawyers um, called us and said, you know, we noticed that our traffic is up this month, and it's all coming from your account. You must have a really big family. And they were worried, I think, that we were trying to take the data and sell it. But once they realized we were academics, um, they let us finish the project. And now um, they actually have research partnerships with people who want uh, to use the old records. So the records are things like census forms um, that you'll fill out and put information about um, your, you know, where exactly you live, what neighborhood you're in, um, your occupation, your industry. Eventually, people wrote down their education levels and their income. Um, And what we see are families there living together, like parent and kids. Maybe in the 1920 census, follow the kid forward to the 1940 census, and you can see what happened to the kid later in life. Hmm. Um, This is actually something that I did with my own uh, great-grandfather, and my own grandfather, who was there in 1920, living in Chicago. And the story of my family is very much the story that we see in the data at large. My great-grandfather was an immigrant, and you can see by tracing him that he never really moved up. He was always doing the same thing, which is basically a little bit above a street peddler. He was gathering things to sell and and trying to make a few extra pennies uh, for each thing he sold. Uh, And then his kids were able to move up beyond him um, and go to high school and um, work as like bookkeeper, stenographer, that sort of office work. Um, And that was beyond what my great grandfather could do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Again, 313-577-1019 is the number on the phones. You can also go to social media, to Twitter and hashtag Detroit Today. And uh, we can work you into the conversation that way. I want to start with a social media comment. Michael on Twitter says, uh, do you think there could be selection bias with who has been immigrants? Anecdotally, I know several immigrants who came here, quote, poor, but from wealthy families elsewhere. So they had tons of support. I think that's a really interesting question, uh, Leah. And I, I, I want to add another dimension to it, um, even if immigrants don't come from wealthy families in other countries, there is something about taking the risk of leaving everything you know behind and going to another country that uh, maybe you know some things about, but where you almost certainly will face more uncertainty than than certainty. And, and whether it's about having the money to come here or not, um, there's something about that drive that also, I think, um, you know, defines the way that that uh, people who come to this country um, see work, see economic opportunity, and and see risk, which which is also, of course, a big part of success. Well, I, I think that's exactly right. Um, if you think about what it would take to not just leave your home city and go to another city in the U.S., but actually leave your home country um, and leave your family behind, uh, the language that you grew up with, um, all of your um, social supports, and to move to the U.S. 
it's really not easy um, and does re- require uh, being willing to take a lot of risk. And I think that's why we end up seeing that um, immigrants are finding those geographic areas that have the most opportunity. Once they're leaving home, they might as well um, go to a spot uh, that will provide a lot of uh, new jobs and, and options for their kids. Um, so there are certainly some U.S.-born people who have that same personality type or that same drive, um, and they're the ones that might be more uh, likely to, to move away, leave their home state. Um, but um, I think that's really what is unique about immigrants, um, and that might be what connects immigrants 100 years ago to immigrants today, despite the fact that otherwise they're, they're so different in terms of where they're coming from and the context in which they're coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go to Genevieve in Plymouth. Genevieve, welcome to the show. Hi. Hey. Good morning. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Go ahead. So I'm an immigrant. I have been here for uh, about 30 years. We immigrated from Argentina. I'm the first generation, I'm actually the first person to not only graduate high school, but also graduate college. And I do think that both myself and my brother are a success immigrant story, um, partly based for all the reasons you're talking about, you know, the hard work ethic, the moving to a location where work was uh, plentiful, um, and also having the, the slight burden of understanding firsthand what we gave up when we left our culture, our people, our home, hmm. and in, in living a life that would do justice to all the sacrifices that both my mom and my dad and myself and my brother made when leaving Argentina and acclimating to a new culture. Yeah, yeah. Um, Genevieve, I really appreciate the call uh, and that story, um, Leah Bustan, Bustan, we are going to have you. Um, we're going to have you respond to that when we get back. We're going to take a quick break, uh, and uh, when we come back, we're going to continue talking about immigrants and immigration here in America with uh, Leah Bustan. We'll also continue to hear from you on social media and on the phones. Phyllis and Warren, Bernadette and Old Redford, we'll get to you next after we have Leah respond to Genevieve's story. If you want to join them, three. 313-577-1019 is the number here on the phones. We'll be right back with more Detroit Today. Listening to Detroit Today on 1019 WDET. I'm Stephen Henderson, and as always, thanks for tuning in. Our guest is Leah Bustan, who is a professor of economics at Princeton University and the co director of the development of the American Economy Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. She's got a new book called Streets of Gold America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success. Uh, In it, she talks about the reasons that immigrants to this country, especially immigrants right now, uh, find economic success. Uh, We want to hear from you during the conversation call and tell us uh, what your sense is of immigration and opportunity right now. Are you somebody who is an immigrant? Are you from a family of immigrants? Call and tell us the story of how you came to this country and whether you found uh, opportunity, economic opportunity. What did you have to do to find opportunity here. Uh, Also, give us a call and let us know about barriers to opportunity that you found as an immigrant. As always, the number here on the phones is 313-577-1019. That's 313-577-1019. You can also go to Twitter and hashtag Detroit Today, and we can try to work you into the conversation that way. Leah, right before the break, we heard from Genevieve in Plymouth about her immigrant story from uh, her family coming from Argentina and the sacrifices uh, that they had to make. I I was struck by, again, the sense of obligation that she was expressing 
to find success, to make the sacrifices that her family made pay off. There again, an incentive that um, that is somewhat somewhat unusual, um, if not unique, to, to to immigrants in this country. Well, we always learn from hearing the individual stories um, of immigrants or children of immigrants. It's one of the great things about the work that we do, even though our work is so data-driven, you know, it's based on millions of cases. There's a lot that we learn from bringing together millions of records, but there's also a lot that's lost. So we lose the the individual motivations that we were able to hear in Genevieve's story. Um, And we always want to go back and forth between them. Um, So what we can see in the data is things like, well, geography really matters. But what we hear in the stories is also about some of the psychology of being an immigrant. And I think that that that's really important as well. Yeah. Again, Genevieve, really appreciate the call and uh, and the comments. Let's go to Phyllis and Warren. Phyllis, what's on your mind? Hi, Stephen, and your guests. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have just some thoughts that were racing through my mind as, as all of this was being spoken of. Who were Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay? Were they first generation, second generation? And remember, if they were second or third generation, did they come from the uh, immigrants that were sent here from England, the prisoners that they wanted to dump? The bad, the bad element that they wanted to get off their islands so that they could be safer. That's the generation that came here. And these were the people then who, what, started the Constitution, wrote all of that. And to go further ahead, in the Second World War, we had many immigrants come here. Hmm. And I can remember many a classmate who would be perhaps seven, eight years old, and I would go to the local little grocery store or something, and they would be sweeping the floor because their parents owned the grocery store, lived in the back behind the grocery store, and they were trying to survive by selling groceries in Chicago, which is where I came from. And I think that our generations have been very different, and I think that we are in a different time, and we're at a time even when we feel or have an element, have an element in our society that feels we're white and we're right, and that's not the way we should have it. Yeah. And I would really be interested in knowing how far back, we want to go with this immigration That's talk. Really, yeah, Phyllis, I, I I really appreciate that idea, and I'm glad you called to share it. Leah Bustan, let's start with the idea of this quote-unquote founding generation in, in America and whether there's an immigrant dynamic with them because, of course, they were not from families that were native to this continent. They were They were from families of immigrants. Well, that's exactly right. Alexander Hamilton is famous for being an immigrant himself. He was an immigrant, right. <laughs> he was an immigrant um, from uh, from the Caribbean. Um, and uh, the legend is that that gave him his special, um, you know, real gumption to try to succeed and prove himself. Uh, so even going that far back into our history, um, there have always been immigrants who are trying to make their mark. So this is not a new part of uh, the U.S. story. But some of our founding fathers, uh, Ben Franklin is famous uh, for complaining that uh, now new uh, new people are coming to the country, and they're coming to the country from Germany uh, instead of from England, uh, and that the Germans would somehow never assimilate, uh, never learn English, uh, never become one of us. Mm-hmm. And now it seems almost laughable to think that Germans wouldn't be uh, part of uh, the American fabric. Um, and now there are new groups that people point to and mm-hmm. say, well, they'll ne- never learn English and they'll never become one of us. Um, but I think what we've seen, if you go as far back as the founding generation, um, is that there's been many waves of immigrants to the country um, and they've all gone through this process of 
becoming American, maybe all in slightly different ways. I don't want to flatten out all the differences, uh, but I think the important similarity there is that um, within a generation, um, we see people becoming American um, at actually much the same pace now as they did in the past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, Phyllis, I really do appreciate uh, the call and the question. Um, I want to go back to social media and and uh, read a comment from from Michael, uh, who says further, I get really nervous when I hear data that can be used nefariously to say, quote, poor Detroiters have themselves to blame. Look at how great the immigrants are doing. And that comment reminds me, of course, of um, of some of the racial and class implications of this of this conversation. Uh, of course, this is a, a country where there is deep inequality along racial lines and and deep inequality along um, economic lines that that often has to do with race. How does this conversation about immigrant success fit into that? Um, how does how does the success that immigrants are able to find in America bump up against? the the real barriers that still exist for so many people in this country just to participate uh, on a fair basis in in American life. Well, there's two different elements to uh, you know how I would want to respond. Um, the first is that you know we shouldn't assume that all of the immigrants we're talking about today um, are are white or that they're non-black. Mm -hmm. um, in fact. Um, we're able in the modern data to look at around 45 different sending countries. Five of them are majority black sending countries. Um, and uh, the, the statement about um, the children of immigrants doing remarkably well, um, moving up from uh, lower income households up to uh, the middle class, um, is true also of uh, children from majority black countries whose parents uh, themselves are immigrants and are black. Um, and this is true for uh, Nigeria, for Dominican Republic, um, and for a number of Caribbean countries. But there is a caveat there, actually, which is that uh, for children from Haiti, Jamaica, and Trinidad and Tobago, uh, daughters are doing remarkably well, and sons are are not. They're not doing particularly worse than the sons of U.S. born white parents who are raised at the same level, mm -hmm. um, but they're not doing better. So they're the one caveat that we have to the idea that the children of immigrants um, are moving up at a faster pace. Um, but what I want to point to there is that it's really not just a race story. It's race, gender, and also um, region, because the Caribbean is a particular place with a particular history. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to bring uh, those particular cases into the discussion as well. Um, but then on the topic of you know, data being used in particular ways, it's kind of interesting. If we had found that the children of immigrants were not moving up well, that they were staying behind, lagging behind, and you know, then I think people would point to the book and say, we should shut the border down. You know, um, immigrants are a permanent underclass. They're not making it anymore the way they used to. But instead, we're finding that the children of immigrants are doing well, and we're finding um, a kind of pushback in the other direction. Well, maybe we should shut the border down now because the children of immigrants are doing too well. You know, like maybe we should preserve the opportunities mm. for people who were born here. You know, why should we give all of our opportunities away? Um, so it does sort of feel like whatever it is that we had found, there would have been a, a take on the findings um, that um, was concerned or hesitant about immigration. Um, and the fact that it could kind of go either way there um, really taught me that um, what we need to do is just lay the facts out. Mm. And different people will come to the facts with, uh, with different um, commitments or pre-existing ideas. Uh, but the way that we see it is that um, it's, it's really um, a, a new set of facts to teach us that we don't need to be scared of the new generation of immigrants. We don't need to compare them negatively against immigrants from Italy or Ireland or Germany 100 years ago. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, we'll take one more call before uh, we have to break. Uh, Methro in Detroit. Methro, welcome to the show. Are you there, Methro? Hello? Uh, hi. Can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, talk about my own experience uh, moving to the U.S. back in 2014 from Ukraine. Mm. Um, I'm 32 years old now. And adding on to what your previous callers were saying about uh, strong work and you know, desire to uh, succeed after sacrifices, I very much can relate to that. And uh, uh, lots of people uh, could think, oh, you know, again, I didn't to uh, your guess that I'm a white immigrant, so I succeeded because of that. But at the beginning, I was really uh, doing a lot of custodian work, pretty much cleaning toilets, sometimes mm -hmm. working 14-hour days. Wow. And... At some point, I was able to save up for a decent car, owning a house, and so on. So, <clears throat> the same uh, story uh, with my mom, who uh, came to Detroit a couple of years later, and she kind of proceeds with the same uh, success path, mm -hmm. uh, and her uh, experience even harder than mine because she moved here when she was in her 50s. She didn't speak any English, wow. didn't know how to drive, and she still uh, was able to have her own business, same, uh, buying a car, owning a house, stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I can't speak uh, about statistics because I don't really not I'm not knowledgeable about that uh, just wanted to share my experience yeah uh, an experience of my mom yeah Methro I, I really appreciate you calling and sharing that experience I mean as I said at the top of uh, this conversation you know the, the 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 richness of our immigrant communities here is absolutely one of the strengths of southeast Michigan and and your story is is an absolutely wonderful, I think, uh, example of that. Uh, Leah Bustan, before we, before we break, uh, talk about w how we need to sort of, I guess, change some of the ways that we think about immigrants to encourage more of what, uh, what Methro is describing here and more of what uh, we have been talking about uh, in this conversation. Well, I think we need to recognize that uh, today's immigrants are going to become tomorrow's Americans. Um, we saw that process happen 100 years ago, and we're very comfortable with that. Um, you know, we have a president who talks about his Irish heritage, um, and um, that's something that um, we all accept. But there's a lot of division right now about whether current immigrants are going to have the same experience. And from what we see in the data, immigrants from today are doing economically just as well, and culturally are becoming American at the same pace as immigrants 100 years ago. So if you think that immigrants from Ellis Island are good, today's immigrants are also doing just as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Leah Bustan, it was really great to have you here with us for this conversation. Uh, congratulations on the book, and thanks for joining us on Detroit Today. Thanks for having me, and thanks for all the calls. We're going to take another break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the Michigan Supreme Court decision to protect LGBTQ rights against discrimination, a subject that we have talked about for a long time here on Detroit Today, and last week's decision is an absolute milestone in that conversation and in the fight for equality. Stay tuned for more Detroit Today. Bringing you news that matters. Stories that impact your life. 
music from the Motor City and around the world. This is 1019 WDET, Detroit's NPR station. This is Detroit Today on 1019 WDET. I'm Stephen Henderson, and as always, thanks for tuning in. You know, it's something that a lot of people in Michigan may not have realized, but for many, many years, if you were part of the LGBTQ community here in Michigan, you could have been legally discriminated against in the workplace and in other settings. Despite all of the progress that has been made in equality, in the march toward equality for the LGBTQ community, that has been an outlier. But after a Michigan Supreme Court re- ruling of 5-2 to two came down last week, that is no longer the case. Justice Beth Clement, a Republican nominee, wrote the majority opinion uh, for this case. In it, she said, quote, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation necessarily constitutes discrimination because of sex. It is no different in the court's estimation than gender discrimination. Mid the United States Supreme Court slate of conservative rulings, this ruling is an interesting one here in Michigan, and it's being hailed by LGBTQ advocates as historic progress. Here to talk with us about this is Jay Kaplan. He's an LGBTQ rights project staff attorney at the ACLU of Michigan. He has joined us several times to talk about uh, this issue. Jay, welcome back to Detroit Today. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. It's good to be back. It's great to have you here. So first, just give me your reaction to the court's uh, to the court's ruling. As I said, you and I have had this conversation many times uh, in light of the, the, the tremendous progress that we've been making in, in other areas of of the law. This has been slow to come, but, but including LGBTQ rights under Elliot Larson, which is our anti-discrimination law here in Michigan, is is a huge step. I think I I would imagine that you would you would agree. <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more. This really is a historic decision, and as a result of last week's decision, that means that LGBTQ people have comprehensive civil rights protections against discrimination, not only in employment but housing, education, and public accommodations. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said, this this is something that I'm not sure lots of people uh, were necessarily aware of. But but describe some of the things, some of the discrimination that uh, members of the LGBTQ community faced in in reality uh, before before this ruling. Sure. Well, in addition to employment discrimination, we know that there have been many incidences of discrimination in housing. We know, well, we've seen just across America uh, legislation attacking LGBTQ youth in schools, and so issues involving education, and uh, then in public accommodations, businesses refusing to provide services to uh, members of the LGBTQ uh, community. And um, you know, as bad as the discrimination is for gay and lesbian individuals, we see it even more so for members of the transgender community. And so to have these comprehensive civil rights protections, to have a remedy that's now available uh, to members of the community who've, who've encountered this kind of discrimination is, you know, it's, it's something incredibly important. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little about the opinion here grounding this in gender discrimination is i think one of the one of the kind of key findings and is uh is an important part of uh of understanding uh why under the law uh lgbtq discrimination uh is is not permissible yes and it's not that the michigan supreme court just decided, made this up you right. know, in terms of this theory. Two years ago, the United States Supreme Court held in the Bostock versus Clayton County decision that when you discriminate against a gay employee uh, for being gay or a transgender employee for being transgender, you do it because of sex. And it relates to the sex that was assigned to them at birth because often they don't comply with the, 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 the stereotypical notions about how you're supposed to look 
or act or present yourself or who you're supposed to love in accordance with the gender that was assigned to you at birth. So what the Michigan Supreme Court, what they were deciding, they were applying that Bostock decision to our state civil rights laws. Yeah. And as I said, uh, the decision was five to two and it was written by a Republican member of of the court, which is yeah. something that we see is in kind of stark contrast to the direction that the U.S. Supreme Court at least seems to be headed with a majority of of Republican members uh, talk about the importance of conservative acknowledgement of the the the, the, the real discrimination that uh, that people face and the need to to address it. Yes, yes, no, it, it can't be underestimated. And you know, really, what this is, it, it's kind of a conservative legal argument. You're looking at the actual language because of sex. What does that mean? And uh, even in the Bostock decision two years ago, now that was a different U.S. Supreme Court, but still you had a six to three majority opinion saying that when you discriminate against gay and transgender people, it's because of sex. And so, but it is very gratifying to see that, you know, clearly a majority of the Michigan Supreme Court agrees uh, with this interpretation, which, which again, is, is, is a conservative interpretation thing. Just look at the language, look at the language of the statute, and this is what that means. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a nice antidote to uh, you know some of the very negative things that we see happening around the country in terms with um, anti-LGBTQ legislation and um, you know the concerns about what the current United States Supreme Court what's next on the uh, on the agenda for that majority. Yeah, yeah. It also strikes me that um, there is something inherently conservative about restraining government from. Uh, treating people uh, differently on the basis of sex or or sexual orientation that the, the the idea that the government should have that kind of power to divide Americans or to deny certain Americans uh, privileges or rights because of who they are that's a that's a conservative argument as well uh, absolutely and, and and the concern as a result of uh the U.S. Supreme Court decision in the Dobbs case overturning Roe v. Wade, Mm -hmm. the idea that uh, the court is now in a direction where they're taking away established rights from people, um, you know, from people who've been marginalized in society, that's uh, that's that's not a concept that you know in the history of the the U.S. Supreme Court that we've that we've been used to, and that's why it's gratifying to see that the Michigan Supreme Court is reiterating these you know these uh, these essential principles and finding that when you actually look at the statute and you and and you you, you recognize that there are protections for members of the LGBTQ community. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm talking with Jay Kaplan. Uh, he is the Project Rights uh, staff attorney at the ACLU of Michigan, someone who joins us pretty frequently to talk about uh, the progress that we're making on making uh, LGBTQ uh, people more uh, more equal in our society, erasing the discrimination uh, that they face under the law. We're talking about last week's Michigan Supreme Court decision uh, that extends Elliot Larson protection to members of the LGBTQ community here in Michigan. Elliot Larson is our anti-discrimination statute. Uh, Jay, we always end these conversations with the same thing, which is, what's next? (laughs) There, there (laughs) There are always other frontiers in which we really need to to change the law so that it's more protective uh, of of everybody. This seems like a pretty big step forward, but I know it's not the last step. No, no. Um, I mean, so what's next is we have to still be vigilant regarding anti-LGBTQ legislation that gets introduced in our state. You know, a bill is int- has been introduced that would prevent transgender students from being able to play sports in accordance with their gender identity. Mm-hmm. I think that clearly violates uh, the Michigan Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act. So we're going to have to you know, be able to use our civil rights laws to challenge efforts to try to continue discriminating against LGBTQ people. Um, I think there's some concerns that um, as a result of what the U.S. Supreme Court did um, in Dobbs that, you know, possibly could marriage equality come into question. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that legally married couples have 
other legal documents in place that protect their relationships and protect their, their you know, parent-child relationships in the event that someone should try to challenge uh, the legitimacy of their marriage. Um, you know, we've made a lot of progress in the state of Michigan in the last couple of years, just administratively with better policies, particularly regarding transgender people being able to get accurate identity documents, being able to access health care. And we want to preserve those gains and uh, not see efforts, you know, be successful to try to take away some of those rights. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Jay Kaplan of the ACLU, it is uh, always great to have you here on the show, and I'm glad you were able to come by today to talk about this really important Michigan Supreme Court opinion. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Okay, that is going to do it for us today. Come back tomorrow when we're going to talk with a former teacher who is teaching government lessons online and breaking partisan lines by uniting people across the political spectrum. Why are we talking about that tomorrow? Of course, because it is going to be Election Day. And remember, we really do need everybody who is uh, registered to vote to get out and cast that vote tomorrow, no matter Whom you are supporting, the important thing is making your voice heard. A lot of people have already voted via absentee because uh, we have great laws in this state that permit that. But tomorrow is, again, Election Day when you can always go and cast your ballot. This is 1019 WDETFM, Detroit's NPR station, your connection to news, music, and conversation. We'll talk again tomorrow.